Good morning. Can I welcome you to the Public Petitions Committee? And could I also remind everyone to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system? Uh, apologies have been received from Jackson Carlow. Uh, first item on the agenda today is consideration of current petitions. And the first item of business is petition PE. 1105 by Marjorie McCann, so on St Margaret's of Scotland's Hospice. Members will, re will recall that this petition was deferred from our meeting in Greece to enable Gil Patterson to attend for the petitioner and to feed any comments on behalf of the hospice. Members have also received an email this morning from the petitioner and the members also have a note uh, by the clerk and uh, two from two Scottish government uh, letters. Can I welcome Gil Parson to the meeting, who has a constituency interest in this petition? And may I now invite uh, contributions from members? I'm rather concerned at the submission that we that was tabled this morning. Uh, that was dated the second of March. Uh, now. I understand there was agreement with Greater Glasgow Health Board, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board and St Margaret's Hospice to carry a review, uh, an impartial review of the funding. However, based on the submission we've received, then I think there is clearly actions being taken behind the scenes, which I think uh, cause severe detriment to any honest and partial assessment being made of the funding to St Margaret's Hospice, particularly the comment on the, at the top of page two, where uh, it's alleged that Katrina Renton from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board has indicated that they should not share the information regarding funding of other hospices within the uh, health board area. And I think this is, uh, goes to the heart of the matter that this committee has been discussing for the last eight years it is about the fairness and equity of funding for hospices in the health board area. Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board have, uh, the only way I can describe it, is procrastinated and procrastinated in actually giving an honest answer to St Margaret's Hospice. Uh, and if this is the statements that are contained in the submission that we've received today are true, then I think, as a committee, we should be writing to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to seek clarification as to the comments that are contained within this submission uh, to find out whether or not it is a fair and honest assessment that's being taken regarding the funding for St Margaret's in comparison with other hospices in the Greater uh, Glasgow and Clyde Health Board area. Because unless we get that comparison, and unless that comparison is open to review, then I think the St Margaret's Hospice will still be being dealt with unfairly and unjustly by Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board. I'm quite happy to support uh, John Wilson's comments. Angus? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm inclined to agree with, uh, with John Wilson on this. Um, uh, and uh, judging by the submission that we've, we've received, uh, it would certainly be um, a, a good idea to seek clarification from Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board while the issue of funding is brought uh, forward on a hopefully more equal basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Can I, first of all, I uh, say thanks to the committee for deferring this in the way you did. Uh, uh, both the hospice and myself are very grateful uh, for that uh, and uh, commend the, the committee in the way they handle these things. Um, I think John Wilson has highlighted one of the two main points that the, the hospice and the, the, the letter refers to. I, I actually don't think they're insurmountable. I, I really don't. Um, first of all, uh, the sharing of information uh, that how how else could you find how could a third party work out what the formula is if they didn't have all the information so I, I think it's entirely right that a, a third party who is looking at this and measuring what each hospice uh, uh, 
gets from Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I, and I, I, you know, I, I think that that's a must. That, that the formula uh, has got to be provided, and the numbers have got to be provided. Uh, so that that's the first thing. But I, I, and I actually think that that is an easy an easy fix. Um, the other one uh, might be slightly more difficult. Uh, is uh, the the hospice also talk about, or the petitioner talks about Grant Thornton and impartiality, uh, because. Grant Thornton has carried out work on behalf of both the Scottish Government and Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, Health Board. And the, I, I think what was, we were hoping for was that we would have someone in place that had no connection uh, to either parties. Uh, and you know, that might be a bit more difficult, uh, but again, not, not uh, insurmountable. And what would draw the, the committee's attention to is uh, the, the comments uh, in the letter attributed to the chief executive, uh, Sister Rita, whose, uh, whose work uh, in the hospice is, is, is renowned. Uh, and both the hospice itself, its work is renowned. It's got a terrific uh, record. Uh, every inspection uh, is always uh, impeccable, the uh, results that come through. But you'll see in there that, that, that uh, Sister Rita recognises that through good hard work I, 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 on the part of different people that you know, the, the gap had closed and last year uh, you know, I think the, the hospice appreciates uh, the work that's been done. So from my perspective, we're very, very close uh, uh, to a final conclusion. I, think I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn I, in saying that I, I've been told that it's just a little bit to go and, and this should be solved. So uh, I appreciate uh, the, the point that John Wilson makes uh, and I, I welcome uh, the point. That might just uh, bring clarity uh, to where the main uh, blockages are. I, I, maybe it's faith that I've got in what's happened so far. But I certainly think that there is a willingness uh, in all parties to, to come to a good conclusion on this. And uh, the assistance of this, this, uh, this uh, committee has been really uh, played a big part in that. And, and I would ask that the committee, apart from what uh, John Wilson, MSP, has, has asked for, that the, the uh, petition be kept open uh, uh, for these reasons. Thank you. Before we move to a uh, decision, I wonder if you can advise us, Mr. Pars and uh, Gil, if uh, my understanding is that parties agreed to grant Thornton undertaking a review. Is this correct? I, I don't think that's quite correct. I think what they agreed to was that they agreed, the parties agreed that there would be someone put in place to look at the issues, a, a chartered accountancy firm. That's quite correct. I, I don't think it was ever accepted on the part of the hospice that it would be Grant Thornton. Um, if you look at the history uh, that's, uh, of uh, the relationship between uh, Greater Glasgow Clyde and the hospice, then there's always a cautious uh, approach taken by the hospice. Uh, I, I might be wrong, but I think I'm fairly certain that the hospice never agreed to Grant Thornton. Uh, however, they were doing what I would call due diligence to ascertain exactly who Grant Thornton were, etc. And it's, it's in regard to that, asking questions and uh, finding out uh, through not a simple, straightforward yes-no answer, it's got to be said. I have seen the correspondence that I, if Grant Thornton, in my view, had answered in the affirmative the way they did in the last uh, uh, email, there may not have been a problem. But because uh, that they had to be asked several times, if there had uh, been you know, a, a conflict of interest, uh, working not from the government, I don't think, but with Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So that, that's the element of, that's the element of uh, um, if, if you like, credibility that, that is, I think, more difficult to, to to uh, solve. But the straight question is, I'm fairly certain that the hospice never agreed to Grant Thornton. 
Angela? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I mean, I, I'm quite clear in my mind that I, I would quite clearly want to con continue this. However, I'm, I'm a little puzzled in terms of what the remit of the committee is in terms of ins in certain instructions. I mean, if you're looking for a third party to come in to resolve an issue, who's going to instruct that third party? Who's going to pick up the cost for that third party to do that? And how long will it take? I mean, these are the questions I would like someone to answer for me. I think the... Uh I think I, I think I believe that the committee has a right to to make that you know a request to be made that we can write to Glasgow Health Board you know for for that information following on from this latest petition. But I think the other question I would like to ask would be along the lines of if we could find out if uh, the hospice did you know raise in writing or uh, their concerns with Grant Thornton being part of the the review committee. Yes, I, I I think we can provide that uh, okay. information, and I could answer the other question okay. that uh, Mr. Malik uh, raised. Uh, the money has been set aside uh, for the third party to conduct uh, this uh, uh, work, so that there's no question that, that it, it's not going to be uh, uh, paid for, and, and it's already allocated. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. However, I would still like to see uh, an end date on this. This seems to be going on for a rather long time. And I think it's, it's unhealthy to, to allow this to fester for such a long time because it will affect people, employment and, of course, service delivery. So I'm keen for this to come to an early conclusion. And is it something we can do to help speed up that process? John. Thank you, convener. I think uh, given that I've sat in the committee for the, the all during the period we've considered this petition, then I think... I can say from the last session, the committee were clean, clear, clear in terms of looking for an early resolution. The difficulty has, and I, and I made the comment earlier, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board seem to have procrastinated. At first, it was about Blower Hill provision that the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board were talking about. Then it came down to, and if we look at the material we have in front of us today for consideration, we have two letters from two different cabinet secretaries almost a year to the day uh, sent one on the 17th of uh, February 2015 and prior to that one on the 19th of February 2014 both from cabinet secretaries who said that they were moving forward uh, with the investigation and the review of the funding. The difficulty is, is that uh, the, and to add on to the question that's been asked about the Grant Thornton issue if we are writing to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board could I suggest we ask Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board how many uh, companies they put forward to act as investigators on this matter and whether or not Grant Thornton was the only company that was presented to uh, St Margaret's Hospice uh, for consideration because it would be useful and the, the part of the difficulty I think in making the demand that you get somebody impartial to carry out this review is I think there will be very few companies out there that are completely impartial who have not worked for Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board or potentially worked for the Scottish Government. So it is about trying to find out whether or not there was a list of organisations that were provided to the uh, hospice so they could then do, as uh, Gil Patterson said, due diligence on what organisation they felt would be not, well, preferable to the hospice. Uh, that they felt would be a genuinely impartial uh, review of the services that were being delivered and the funding being made available. So it is about, as I said, maybe in amongst that we write to Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board and just seek that clarification. Okay. Right, so the uh, so to consider what action we're going to take in relation to this uh, petition, uh, do we agree then that we're going to... Uh, Right to Glasgow Greater Health Board with regards to the latest email come in and, and the issues there. We also add to that letter uh, whether they alone uh, appointed uh, Grant Thornton or was it indeed the Scottish Government who may have uh, uh, hired Grant Thornton, I don't know. And this, the, sorry, and the, the third one is that 
could we write to the hospice and see if they, at any given time, did raise concerns about Grant Thornton with either Greater Glasgow Health Board or, indeed, the Scottish Government? Agreed. Agree that? And Salah? I'm going to draw the attention to the Health Board in the sense that we really want a conclusion. I, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't like this idea of ping-ponging. I actually want a result. I think we've had enough ping-ponging. So um, we, we need to bring this to a close, and I think we, we'll, we should be seeking a date when they can actually suggest a closing date. I think that's important. We need to have a benchmark now. I think we can't just keep going on endlessly. Well, uh, we know it's been on for 2007, but I think that, you know, there have been other issues that have been raised today, and I think it's only right that we, we do what's requested in the, the committee here, and, and we're right. Then when that information comes back, then, you know, there'll be recommendations will be on the paper there. We can then decide then as to what we do, whether we continue with the petition or whether we close the petition. Uh, and what do you suggest is a fair time frame for that to happen? Well, I think the, I think the normal time, if you're writing to any organisation, you expect a reply back within 20 days. So if it can't happen this month, I'm no doubt that this petition could be back maybe sometime around about April on the committee. Yeah? Uh, I'm, Chair, I'm just simply saying, I'm, I'm stressing the point that we really need to bring this to a conclusion. Yeah, and, and, and so we need to we need to suggest to the health board that we are now seeking for this to be drawn to an end rather than yeah. another set of correspondence. I think I think in reaching that conclusion, then I think the committee's got to be really, really aware of all the facts. And you know, if you're writing to uh, the people who have identified here. We'd expect, you know, a response back from him to sometime, hope, you know, bring his petition back to committee uh, in round about April time. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, Gil. The next petition is PE1537 uh, by Shona Brash on behalf of the Coastal Regeneration Alliance on the proposed energy park at Kikenzie. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. And can I welcome Ian Gray to the meeting who has a constituent interest in this petition. Uh, can I invite members for any contributions? Mr Gray. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak briefly to this petition uh, once again. Um, the committee will be able to see from the submissions in front of them that, uh, firstly, the uh, Marine Energy Park uh, as a project is continuing. That's clear from uh, a number of the uh, submissions from stakeholders, not least uh, Scottish Enterprise, who make clear that they are deciding on next steps based on assessment of market interest, the outcome of ongoing technical feasibility work, uh, and so on. So it is clear that the, the, the project uh, continues. It, it's also clear, I think, from the submissions the committee have received that the petitioners do not feel that they have received the assurances that they sought, assurances uh, they can accept regarding consultation uh, in the future. Uh, and indeed, I think a lot of the submissions rather try to uh, suggest that consultation has in the past taken place, in spite of the fact that the petitioners and the petition itself uh, made clear to the committee that the community uh, don't accept that. It, it, it's also clear, I think, that uh, the petitioners don't feel uh, uh, that there are indications there they can trust that there will be proper regard given to the community's own aspirations for the site, aspirations which are now uh, quite well developed and were presented to the committee in an earlier stage uh, when the committee considered the petition. The truth is that the community uh, of Kikenzie and Port Seton around this site remain uh, very much in the dark as to, to what is happening, um, exactly the situation which led to the campaign uh, and support for the petition in the first place. Uh, I'd therefore like to suggest uh, to the committee that they continue with this petition uh, and further interrogate uh, the situation. I think the committee could help to provide some clarity uh, for the local community, uh, either by continuing the petition themselves and perhaps seeking evidence 
uh, or by referring the, the petition to uh, an appropriate committee. Uh, my own preference would be for the former, but obviously that's for members of the committee to decide. Uh, but I would strongly request that the committee consider continuing uh, this petition, which has not resolved itself. Angus. Uh, convener, um, clearly the, the issue of energy supply has been a, a major a news, in, the major, in the news agenda for a number of days recently, uh, not least the possible need for a large uh, combined cycle gas turbine uh, in Scotland somewhere. Um, however, the major obstacle in the way of that is the transmission charging regime uh, that discriminates against new electricity gen generation in Scotland. Now, NPF3, um, for want of a better term, is basically a, a government wish list, and there's quite a number of uh, uh, projects on that wish list in, in my constituency, uh, and some of them may or may not uh, come to fruition. However, I, I take on board um, Ian Gray's point that the uh, uh, Kikensi Energy Park um, uh, is, it's, it does seem to be to, to be moving forward as far as Scottish Power are concerned. Um, and it's clear that the Coastal Regeneration Alliance uh, aren't taking any chance, chances with regard to NPF3 uh, not moving the project forward. So um, I think the best way forward would be, given that uh, the issue of energy generation is hotting up, uh, to coin a phrase, um, it w might be an idea to refer this to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, because I'm sure they are going to be doing some, I'm not, I'm not definite, but I, I would imagine that they'll be doing some significant work on this in, in the future with regard to energy supply. David. Um, thank you, Convener. I'm quite happy to support Angus MacDonald's uh, recommendations, mainly because it's a remit of the Energy uh, Economy and Tourism Committee. Energy, you've got a local economy, you've got a tourism aspect, you've got a historic value down there. Um, environmental impact. So I think they could do a far better job than this committee just because it is a remit um, and their specialist subject. So I'm quite happy to hand it over and continue. And Zala? Yeah, um, the, the fact that it's such a high significance, I would have thought that the fact that there are people still working here and we still don't have the, the full uh, package, as to say, I think it may be premature to send it on uh, to the other committee. I would have rather that I had got all the facts before making that decision. And I'm, I'm minded to perhaps continue at this early stage to see uh, the final um, case for what they're trying to achieve before we actually move it forward. I think there's a lot of information still to come. There's still tests going on, and I would like to see those results first to see what's the best way forward. I'm quite happy to continue it. I think it's a way between the two of them. I mean, it does seem to me it's a fluid situation. I think the point made by Ian Gray is quite correct. There's obviously been a almost a democratic deficit. There does appear to be a wish list from government. It does appear to me that that you know Scottish Power and indeed Scottish Enterprise are operating at a level that isn't perhaps taking on board the clear views of the 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 the, 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 the local people. Equally, I understand it's a moving feast. Am I not correct in saying it? If it's not today, it's any day now. They the uh, towers are due to be demolished. I thought I'd seen that somewhere in my own constituency since it affects the Vista. The towers uh, not the chimneys. <clears throat> the towers the chimneys. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, things are moving there. It does seem to me that the Energy Committee would be more appropriate. That's assuming that they're going to accept it, in which case it might be remitted back or whatever. And I don't know if there's a way of satisfying Hamzala's concerns that it's kept alive by initially giving it to a committee that might be more more uh, appropriate, given that it's part of a wider issue, as I say, I think Angus has correctly commented on. But I think what's been correctly raised in the petition is that there's a local democratic deficit that needs addressed. Okay. I think the consensus is then that we, uh, we perhaps refer this to the, uh, the, econ the, <laughs> the Economy Committee and the uh, my understanding is, even though we are referring it, that the petition remains open. Is that right? 
and uh, here, sorry, just for, just for clarification, if we refer this petition to the Economy, Energy, Tourism Committee, then it then rests with that committee to then make deliberations on the petition, and it doesn't. The only information we get back from that committee is what action they have taken on it. And if the committee, the Economy, Energy, Tourism Committee, decides to close the petition, then we have no further jurisdiction over that petition. This is why I was suggesting that, that initially we keep it open to see what other new information comes here before we decide to send it forward. I think it will be perhaps being, I don't think the time is right for it to be sent on at, at the moment the way it stands. I think um, uh, local concerns need to be addressed and let's allow that to happen. I don't think it's going to do any harm by us keeping it open at this stage. Yeah. Convener, I appreciate, I think, a consensus uh, amongst the committee that the petition should not be closed, that it should be continued, and that's welcome. Um, I did say it's for the committee to decide how they deal with this, but I did also say that my preference would be for the committee to take evidence. And perhaps it's worth explaining my reason for that. Um, the thrust of this committee is about the uh, reluctance of the local community to have, as they would feel foisted upon them, a, an industrial development of this scale. So it is indeed more about what happens to the site and to their community uh, than the potential importance for Scotland's energy strategy of, of an energy park at this or an, another site. Um, so there does seem to me to be some merit in continuing to explore um, uh, the nature of consultation and how things have been taken forward before it's further referred. But, but I, I, I do say again, I defer to the committee. That's, that's their decision. OK. What action would we like to take then, colleagues? Given uh, the comments of the, the, the local member, um, you know, clearly, if, if there are members here who are concerned about referring it directly or immediately to uh, the EET committee, then I, I'd be um, content to seek further information um, from Scottish Enterprise and East Lothian Council, for example, um, to request that the public consultations uh, on the development be extended. However, um, that would be with the... Uh, Proviso that ultimately it would be referred to uh, Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee for, for further uh, investigation. Kenny? I'm able to make some informal soundings with the committee because it does appear to me, notwithstanding the legitimate comments Ian Gray makes, that actually they would be more appropriate to do because it's likely not just to be site specific, it's likely to be more general, but it will affect this and it's how do we balance a lot of what is a current government wish list not simply on this site but perhaps on Angus's or elsewhere they would be the more effective committee than we would equally I can understand the points made by John Wilson that there's no point in us remitting it there if they then say we're too busy we ain't doing anything and the worst scenario for Ian Gray's constituents is that nothing then happens because we've got rid of it and they've not accepted it so some you know activities of seeking further information, as Angus says, making some discreet inquiries about the Energy Committee, because I do tend to think, that, along with Angus, that the likelihood is they will be looking at energy in the round, and they could do this as a factor of it that would be more appropriate than a standalone investigation by us, and that, you know, keeping it going for a few weeks pending both a letter to Scottish Enterprise and, indeed, some informal discussions. John Wilson. I agree with uh, Kenny McCaskill that we we should keep the petition open. We should write to East Lothian. We should write to Scottish Enterprise to find out what's happening with this. Because as Angus Macdonald said, the NPF3, like NPF2 and NPF1, was a wish list that was uh, developed by the Scottish Government. There's no actual funding allocated by the Scottish Government in terms of these proposals, and it's down to local circumstances and arrangements whether or not these proposals go ahead. But it would be useful just to write to Scottish Enterprise and uh, East Lothian Council to find out 
where exactly they are in the process. Because if you look at the Scottish Power response that we received, while Scottish Power is the main operator of Cookenzie, they've indicated in their submission that they are not engaged in any negotiations or discussions about taking forward the power plant in any shape or form or being involved in the energy park. So it would be useful just to get clarification from Scottish Enterprise, East Lothian Council. But in getting that clarification, community, I think we need to ask for clear outline of what consultation proposals they, they intend to undertake with the local community in relation to taking forward any proposals for that site and that the, the guarantees are built into that that the community have the right, as they always have, to object to any proposals that come forward. And hopefully, if we get the community empowerment legislation through uh, the side of this year, then they might actually have greater powers under the community empowerment legislation to challenge any proposals that go forward and come up, as they presented to us uh, at the end of last year, uh, with their own proposals for that site. So I would suggest we write to those two agencies and, and as Ken McCaskill said, if the clerks could have an informal word with the committee clerks for the Economy, Energy, Tourism Committee and find out whether or not they have the time within their uh, uh, forward calendar to devote what we would consider considerable consideration of this uh, petition. Thank you. Have we then agreed, colleagues, that we'll write to Scottish Enterprise and East Lothian Council to request that the public consultation on the pro proposed development be extended and to take into account the points that have been raised by the committee members? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. The next item of petition is consideration of, new, of three new petitions, and the committee agreed to hear from the petitioner of all three. The first petition is PE1545 by Anne Maxwell on behalf of the Muir Maxwell Trust on residential care provision for the severely learning disabled. And the uh, members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing on the petition. And may I welcome Anne Maxwell to the meeting and ask her to speak to her petition and to set out in the context what you're looking for, and then we'll move to questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for this opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, please, for a moment, um, walk with me in my shoes. I'm the mother of Muir, who has a severe form of epilepsy called Dravi syndrome. Muir had his first seizure when he was four months old, and we rushed him into a hospital, knowing, not knowing that the legacy of seizures that would follow would leave him profoundly brain damaged and would dramatically alter not just the course of his life, but the course of the life of his family forever. My husband and I are now Muir's legal guardians. For over 18 years, we've been his voice. Muir cannot read, he cannot write, he can barely colour in between the lines. He will never work or marry or have children of his own. He requires care 24-7, including all aspects of personal care. But he is a speaking child, and he has an amazing personality and sense of humour. His behaviours at time are challenging, but there is still much to celebrate. Muir has been a, a pupil at Donaldson's College since he was five years old. At his most cha challenging, around the age of 12, we fought for him to become resident at Donaldson's Lodge. Since that day, Muir has positively thrived with lots of friends and a very fulfilled life. But what the future holds for Muir now that he is 18 is extremely uncertain. I'm also co-founder, along with my husband of the Muir Maxwell Trust, a charity established 12 years ago in Muir's name to support children like Muir throughout the UK and also their families who are struggling to cope. 
Epilepsy, in all its forms, is just one condition, but the Scottish Government's own policy review identifies that 66% of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities have epilepsy. And so the Muir Maxwell Trust, without doubt, represents the most needy group amongst the learning disabled. What is glaringly obvious in our research is that the Scottish Government, by its own admission, lacks factual data on people with learning disabilities, especially those who are profound and may require residential care as an option, because remember, they have no voice. The government relies on data provided by local authorities and social work that often comes through charities like SCLD. And I know firsthand that both are failing to properly assess the needs of this group because of their lack of understanding of the profound disabilities and their lack of proper application of the assessment process. Senior members of my own council have admitted to these failings. Their needs are therefore not being recognised, they're not being understood, and they are not being met, including the desperate need for sophisticated long-term residential care. And by that, I do not mean long-stay hospitals as in the past. Nobody wants those. I have fought a relentless battle for our own son to receive the very best of care, including residential care, and it has worked for him. It would work for many others too, but sadly they have not won their battles as I have and their children have been denied the same care. This all comes to an end shortly for Muir because at great cost to his local authority, he will be an out of area, in fact, out of country placement. There is nothing appropriate by way of sophisticated residential care in Scotland for young people like Muir and this must be urgently addressed. Recommendations 51 and 52 of Scottish Government's review of services, the keys to life, suggest that changes here are in progress. But we fear this review will fail to recognise and importantly, find the substantial funding that is required to meet these needs, in particular, residential care. And the homecoming of our learning disabled in out of country placements planned by Scottish Government for June 2018, will amount to no more than a sorry, please adapt to fit what we have to offer because we cannot meet what will then become an unmet need. The Mansell report says, early intervention and sophisticated long-term arrangements for management, treatment and support will prevent problems arising in the first place. In the absence of long-term arrangements such as residential care, the cost to government will therefore be high as the needs fail to be met and so families fall apart. Only proper assessment of need will lead to recognition and understanding of this most severe and complex group, which will then lead to service delivery in the essential form of sophisticated long-term residential care that does not yet exist in Scotland, other than in much underused and remote areas of child services like Donaldson's College. I would urge Scottish Government to support schools such as Donaldson's with significant public sector investment and encourage local authority placements for children and young people at both the school and in residence, and then go one step further and replicate the service in adult services in partnership with organisations like Donaldson's, which are already delivering they in turn will be the feeder for this long-term residential care with respite for those families who desperately need it. Thank you, Anne. Uh, was there any questions from any members? Come here, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mrs Maxwell. That was quite a powerful presentation on outlining the case uh, for your petition. You made reference to your local authority. Uh, could you expand on what support you have had or what support you haven't had from your local authority in terms of dealing with your son's condition? Um, 
Okay, that dates back a number of years, probably a decade, more than a decade in fact. So um, initially no support from social services. Uh, then uh, after that, poor support from social services. Um, we had engagement from educational psych psychology, which has always been good, I have to say. Um, but in the process of pursuing support for my son Muir, I sought assessment for him under something called a Section 23 assessment of the Children's Scotland Act 1995. It took me 18 months um, to, to, to have that assessment carried out. It really was um, passed from pillar to post. And in the end, it was a student working for Epilepsy Scotland, the charity, um, that I asked to help me uh, with that with that report. Um, it was then passed from pillar to post within the council. Um, and interesting to note that it was the same person that was chairing a number of committees that was passing it from pillar to post. Um, but eventually, through 18 months of fighting, we got the support that we needed to have a placement within Donaldson's College, um, a residential placement. The social worker was then required under uh, statutory obligations to review Muir regularly. She wasn't doing this. Um, and I had deep concerns knowing that the future um, would require an ongoing fight, that if there was nothing on record to support his needs or to evidence his needs, um, then that fight would become harder. So um, we made an approach to the council to ask them to find us another social worker. They did that. We're told we now have the best social worker within children's uh, disability services that they have. Um, but the meetings, the, the looked after review meetings have been poor. The quality of those meetings have been poor. The administration has been poor. Um, very often nobody is given the notice that ne they need to prepare for those meetings, to submit reports for those meetings. Um, the paperwork often just doesn't arrive on time. These meetings are poor from a very basic level of administration, never mind actually really, really uh, then taking the time to understand the very complex and profound needs of my son. Um, and that warranted meetings at a very senior level within the council where they literally um, held their hands up and said that I was right in all my issues and that I needed their help to correct them. There is a fundamental problem within social services um, in terms of understanding of the complex needs of children with disabilities. Thank you for that. And I've uh, got another couple of questions <laughs> arising from it. But in terms of your opening comments, you made reference to 2018 and the phrase you used was out of country care. Would you care to expand on that? We have spent considerable time looking around the country uh, looking around our, our local area and uh, Scotland for long-term care for our son Muir. Once he reaches the age of 19, he won't be leaving school till he's 19. Um, we've investigated everything with social services and the conclusion has been that there is nothing that can support his needs in Scotland. So we are, are uh, looking at, and in fact, he's likely to get a placement at Young Epilepsy, which is in Surrey, in Lingfield, in England. And that would mean not rooting the family and I'm um, assuming... No, because I have two other children, yeah. so it's really not appropriate to do that. It, what it does is it puts enormous distance yeah. um, between ourselves and him. Um, the facility is fantastic. The facility is exactly what he needs. Um, but he has been at Donaldson since he's five years old with the same peer group uh, throughout and consistency of care, the same carers. So for him, who is very fragile emotionally, uh, and he's just an example of many, this is a very devastating change. Uh, and it's only for three to five years. After that, we have to find somewhere else. You indicated that you've been fortunate because clearly, given the, your evidence here today, you have fought hard to get the services you've received. And uh, despite that, you've had to continue to fight to make sure that the services were being delivered in a consistent manner. Uh, and the examples that you gave were you know, getting the, the assessments and reviews by social work staff, uh, now being told that you've got the best social worker on the case. Uh, 
how would you want this petition widened out to ensure that parents of other children who have the same conditions are supported? Because you've hopefully resolved all the issues within the local authority, your local authority area, but I'm sure, as you've indicated, there are parents throughout Scotland who may be facing, if not the same, but similar problems trying to get the social work department and the uh, local authorities to sit up and take notice of their children's conditions. Without sound, wanting to sound arrogant, I am unique. <laughs> In as much as I, I have fought this battle hard and, and furiously for my son, and I have also anticipated the future throughout this journey, which has enabled me to uh, consider what might be required ahead. A lot of parents don't do that. A lot of parents are living day to day and they're still living with the hope that somewhere in the course of this journey there'll be a cure. Um, so therefore, for a lot of parents, the forward thinking is not there. Um, to some extent, I regard myself in a way as their voice. There are parents who are on a daily basis fighting in the same way as I have with their social worker and their social work department um, and with the support of schools uh, that they, they would like their children to attend, the schools will, will, will attend meetings and give them support too. At the end of the day, even with the support of a social worker, you still have to convince the local authority behind that social worker to fund the request and there are times when it's difficult to know if the social worker is representing the local authority or representing the child and the family. Um, and that's a black hole that often results in a negative decision. Um, so first of all, there is a cultural change that is required there so that social workers very clearly recognize that they are responsible, first of all, for the family. Uh, it's about identifying need. Meeting these needs has an associated cost, but that is not the concern of the social worker. That might be the concern of the local authority, but there needs to be a very definite loyalty on behalf of social workers to the families. Additionally, I think we've got to broaden our horizons. The local authorities have to be much, much more supportive of schools like Donaldson's, like the Blind School, there are not many of them. There are very few facilities that are operating at the high end that I'm talking about, in particular, in, in particular where residential care is concerned. So these, I think fundamentally, these schools are not being supported by local authorities in terms of honouring the funding packages. And that's the best way in which, if we could get that support, we could then support the families. Thank you very much. Mrs Maxwell, you did say that uh, you had a concern about the lack of data that, that, that was held with uh, the Scottish Government and, uh, and some of the data you know, that we have seen. It would, you know, it, it would appear that uh, the demand for residential uh, care is, is on the decrease. And, and this is because of uh, independent living. And uh, so with regards to the, the lack of data, could you maybe expand a wee bit on, on your concern in relation to that? First of all, I think we have to be clear that we, we, we're, there is no uh, clear definition of, of residential care when we talk about it. It's a phrase that's used a lot. It conjures up images of the, the long-stay hospitals of the past, which nobody wants. It conjures up images of, um, let, let, let's say, care homes, which we have a number of in the community. Um, but what we don't have, um, certainly in adult services, is the residential care um, that is similar to that supporting a school. So. The example I use is Donaldson's and the residential lodge attached to that school. That is unique residential care. The decline in interest in residential care is inevitable because there were historically so many people in long-stay hospitals. That had to come to an end, and I fully support that strategy, which was recommended in the year 2000. Um, and there is no doubt that a lot of these patients or these people with learning disabilities um, have been and will continue to be supported well in the community. I'm actually talking about a very small number of profoundly learning disabled 
who are actually not capable of living independently within the community, whose needs are actually greater than that than a traditional care home can support, um, whose needs are actually so profound that they need 24-7 care and they need to be engaged fully uh, to enable all the problems that otherwise might arise in their care because they become unmanageable, perhaps behaviourally, health-wise or, or, or otherwise. Um, the statistics are wrong because they are obtained from local authorities and from social services. And I know firsthand, because of the way in which they have gathered our information, that, that, that the information they are uh, feeding back to Scottish Government via charities and so on is incorrect because they don't understand the disabilities themselves. My local authority, after my meeting with them, said, we need someone like you to come in and speak with social workers and educate them about these profound disabilities and how difficult they are to manage in order to help them identify them. So from the ground up, the data is not, is not coming to you. The people who know the children best are the families and the information process, the assessment process at the front line just isn't happening to enable you to have the proper information. And do you then think perhaps, uh, you know, in your answer to John Mawson earlier on there, you said that, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with social workers, it's more fighting. Uh, so do you think that it's probably a lack of understanding of, of social workers and, and being involved or...? Um, a lack of understanding on behalf of social workers. I, I think social workers are failing to identify this small group of profoundly learning disabled children as distinct from those who are learning disabled. It's a small minority, uh, but they are severe and they are complex. And social workers in the main are not understanding the needs. With that, with that lack of understanding, they don't recognize the need to apply the assessment process rigorously in order to have a grasp of the needs. Have you ever been in touch with any other organisation with regards to your petition? I'm, I'm thinking especially here about the Scottish Consortium, Consortium for Learning Difficulties. I have campaigned on various things on behalf of the Muir Maxwell Trust for, for some time. Um, and I know SCLD also campaign similarly, but they don't campaign for the same group of children. Um, and uh, sorry, the same group of people. We represent a very small group of people that are profoundly learning disabled. SCLD tend to represent the majority of learning disa disabled people as distinct from this small group who are profoundly learning disabled. I've always felt that if I were to become part, if we were to become part of that coalition, then there is a risk that our voice becomes diminished on behalf of those who are profoundly learning disabled. So I'm aware of what they're doing. I think they're aware of what I am doing. But no, we don't campaign together. Okay. Any other questions? There's no further questions. Can I invite the committee to consider what action it wishes to take in relation to this petition? Kenny? I think we should be writing to this. Scottish Government asking for their position. I, I, I think there is clearly a gap. I know from a constituency issue I've had myself, not the same disability that uh, Mrs Maxwell's son is suffering from, but there is a lack of facilities for young adults who leave uh, care provision that's available for children. There is tragically on occasion people dealt with in mental health facilities for adults when they are clearly not suffering from a mental health impediment. The right thing to some extent is done for, or the wrong thing rather is done for the right reasons. They should not be in mental uh, health institutions in the city of Edinburgh, but I can understand the pressures on a council when care in the community is a, a quarter of a million. Uh, but something has to be done. I can understand that there are restrictions and limitations in a smaller jurisdiction. Many of these in institutions even i have noticed it in Specialist criminal justice matters sometimes have to go south because we don't have the, perhaps the number. I'm not necessarily convinced that we've not got a need and that we don't have the number. And therefore, I think 
the Scottish Government, the organisation, to have some general overview, because it does seem to me, whether it's Muir Maxwell or whether it's my own constituent, young people leaving uh, care facilities for uh, as children uh, come into the big wide world and are not provided for. Could perhaps I also suggest that in, in writing to the Scottish Government, could we perhaps, because it's a new petition, write to Learning Disability Scotland, a Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability and Scottish Exile, Scotland Exile, seeking their views on this petition? John? Convener, when we're writing to the Scottish Government, could I ask the Scottish Government if it does collect the data regarding uh, the number of young adults? or adults who have profound learning needs uh, and would benefit from residential care uh, because I'm concerned, uh, as Mrs Maxwell has outlined, that the only residential care that may be available for Muir is in Surrey uh, and I and would like to get some understanding from the Scottish Government whether or not they have made the assessment and whether or not there should be some provision within Scotland that allows parents that option, uh, because the, by breaking up the family, by moving someone to Surrey, that breaks up the family, breaks, breaks up the family link. And it may be that if, if we can get accurate figures from the local authorities and health boards as to the number of uh, young adults and adults with profound learning needs, that there could be a case for a, some service to be delivered in Scotland uh, that, that's similar to the Donaldson's uh, Lodge or the Donaldson's School uh, for those uh, individuals so that they can actually keep that family link uh, rather than lose complete uh, relationship with the families and uh, potentially the wider family uh, because some of these young adults and adults do have not only family, close family, but they also as Mrs Maxwell indicated they have peer group uh, support as well uh, and it would be I don't think it's frightening to think we could actually completely separate them and divorce them from that, those links that have been created uh, throughout their lives Kenny I've got an extensive list of people we're proposing to write to but one of Mrs Maxwell's comments also related to social workers and I wondered whether we could write to Alan Baird, the Chief Social Work Advisor, because it does seem to me some of this may be about training and level of understanding for undoubtedly hard-pressed social workers, but I do know epilepsy is a very specialist thing, and I remember having to go through the same within the police in terms of perceptions of epilepsy are usually about somebody having a fit in a room, not realising it manifests itself in a variety of ways, so some level of understanding from the Chief Social Worker Advisor as to what he expects and whether he thinks there needs to be any improvement within training might be helpful. Does the committee then agree to the action points raised? Agreed. Thank you. Can I thank you, Mr Maxwell, thank uh, for you. your attendance? Thank you very much. much appreciated. Hey, I'll now suspend for a couple of minutes.
The next petition is PE 1536 by Acre Jones on definition of adultery. Uh, members have a note by the clerk and a space briefing. The petition uh, and the submission from the Free Church of Scotland. May I welcome the petitioner, Acre Jones, to the meeting and uh, I will now invite you, Ms Jones, to speak for, to your petition for around five minutes and then we'll move to questions. Okay. Um, first up, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to actually speak about my petition. What, am I, what I am seeking through submitting this petition is for the definition of adultery to be amended so that it is applied also to spouses who have been unfaithful by the involvement of, of same-sex extramarital relationships. My intention of this petition is not to see the adultery laws abolished. I am a Christian myself and I am proud to call myself a Christian. And I recognise the importance of safeguarding the adultery laws for people like myself that follow a faith and for non-religious people that value the principle of faithfulness in a marriage and see adultery as wrong. As the definition of adultery stands under current law, it's discriminatory as one section of society is being treated differently than another. It makes the law unequal and the current marriage bill should reflect marriage equally. Using unreasonable behaviour as an alternative under the current legislation, as it suggests, does not quite address the issue, which is marriage equality should mean equality in all respects, there should be no violation of this fundamental principle. Furthermore, unreasonable behaviour can be defined very widely, widely. It does not only apply to infidelity. It has been used as common grounds for divorce in the UK divorce law for incidents that covers antisocial behaviour, domestic violence, substance misuse, etc. The right to equality is a basic human right that the government has a duty to protect, respect and fulfil, that is enshrined in law and respected in practice in all aspects. As the definition currently stands, it is a direct breach of the following legislations. Article 1, Universal Declaration on Human Rights that states, all human beings are born free and equal in, in dignity and rights. Particle 7, to the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, Article 5, that promotes equality between spouses to enjoy quality of rights during marriage and in the event of its dissolution. The Human Rights Act 1998 places a duty on safeguarding existing human Human rights and a duty on government, the courts and other public bodies to respect human rights. Under the Equality Act of 2010, it is in breach of Article 13.1, which is a direct discrimination as it treats one person less favourably. Article 27.5, it is a form of victimisation as it is committing a breach of an equality clause or rule. And Article 19, it's an indirect discrimination as it places one person at an, at a, at an disadvantage. As stated, my intention is not to see the adultery laws abolished. In a world where morals is on the decline, we live in a world that has become a bitter place, more social problems, more divided, more hostile. We are living in a world that needs to safeguard our morals more than ever. Marriage is one of the most important institutions in our society. Faithfulness is an essential part of marriage and the adultery, of adultery laws upholds this belief. The law, our morals, social and spiritual behaviours is steeped in biblical principles. Don't steal, do not commit adultery, love one another, to be a good Samaritan, do not commit adultery, etc. Adultery is not just a personal offence against the injured spouse. It is an offence against morality laws that has enormous, enormous consequences for the rest of society. It is a clear violation of the contractual obligation between a, a married couple. In the UK, we treat adultery as a civil and personal matter, but we seem to forget that in many parts of the world, like Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, North Korea, Taiwan, Pakistan, and currently in 26 states in the USA, adultery remains an offence against the law and is punishable by fine and imprisonment. This parliament needs to leave a legacy to future generations of a powerful moral compass that informs us what is acceptable and what is not, and a set of values that treats everyone equally, tr sorry, and treats everyone equally, recognises and protects human basic rights. We need to leave, we need to leave this world in a better place than, we, than what we found it in. Moral fibres binds the nation together. Removing the adultery laws will affect the moral fibres of our society, contributing to the decline of morals, create more social problems, and it will leave a legacy to future generations 
generations that unfaithfulness is acceptable. It would devalue the importance of faithfulness within a marriage. It would send out a message that adultery does not matter and does not cause harm to the injured party. This may lead to an increase in divorce rates, placing further pressure on existing services, and divorce law will eventually slide more towards a fully no-fault system. Remove... Parliament cannot remove adultery laws without finding itself in breach. Under the Equality Act 2010, religion, its characteristics, beliefs and beliefs are protected for people who follow a faith. Removing the adultery laws will breach this law and is a form of discrimination against those who follow the fundamental principle that marriage is based on exclusive sexual fidelity and where, faithfulness has been, where unfaithfulness has been cited, religion decrees that grounds of, of adultery need to be used to petition for divorce regardless of gender status. A sexual relationship, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual, is an, is an equivalent betrayal to the injured spouse, causes deep distress to the betrayed partner and as has been seen, rips the fabric of society as it tears marriages and families apart. It is important for an individual to be able to dissolve a marriage in such a manner that does not compromise both their faith and integrity. People have a right to marry how they choose, so they should also have a, a, a choice on how, how to divorce. This parliament has it within its scope to, to change the definition of adultery without removing the adultery laws. In the UK, adultery is defined as voluntary sexual intercourse with a member of the opposite sex who is not the person's spouse. In, in the USA, adultery is defined as voluntary sexual relations between an individual who is married and someone who is not the individual's spouse. The Bible defines adultery as consent, consensual sexual union. As can be seen, there are many term, terminologies available to this parliament to redefine the definition of adultery. In closing, Scotland is a wealthy nation of culture, history, natural beauty, creativity, forward thinkers, leaders in academia, science, research, politics, has produced prime ministers over, the, over history, etc. Let us not become a nation that is poor when it comes to morals. Removing the adultery laws will divide a nation on morals. Mark 3 verse 24 in the Bible says it well, and if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Questions? Ms. Jones, you actually gave, throughout your opening statement there, uh, on several occasions you made reference to the adult current legislation on adultery uh, not being removed. Uh, your petition uh, in itself is fairly straightforward. It's uh, basically one sentence in saying, basically, you want the adultery legislation to apply to all forms of marriage. Uh, why, uh, why, if you're so concerned in terms of your opening remarks, that the, by pushing forward this petition, do you fear that there could be a ch change in the legislation to take adultery out of the legislative framework. I am, I am very concerned about it because I have been reading it in the papers since last October where my petition actually has been referred to and there has been, um, it's been stated, you know, um, there has been concerns that if this petition goes through that the adultery laws will actually be abolished and that's not the actual intention of my petition. My, 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 the intention is to change the definition. So I just need to highlight also the importance yeah. also of, you know, the consequences that may occur if the adultery laws were actually removed and, you know, this parliament has the option to actually redefine def uh, the definition of adultery yeah. without actually removing its laws. Yeah, as I said, it's just that... that where that concern was coming from, because if you were so concerned that the current adultery legislation would be dropped in light of this petition, then it, no, it's just one of these unintended consequences uh, of your petition may be some consideration by, say, the Scottish Government or other, other agencies mm -hmm. to say that, that this is a time to review the adultery legislation as it currently stands yeah. Yeah. and either widen the definition or uh, they may actually, uh, as you quite rightly said, think the adultery legislation is antiquated and therefore is no longer fit for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the, the other reason why I raised that concern is also obviously you read the briefing um, provided by the SPICE, the, the Information Centre and all that, and there was also, again, in the recommendation there about abolishing the adultery laws and all that, so that's the other reason why I yeah. kind of needed... I felt like it was important for me to highlight that so there's no kind of confusion of what I, I'm trying to achieve through my petition. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Any other questions? Can I therefore ask the committee members what action they are prepared to take in this petition? Kenny? Well, I think we should just simply close the petition. I think the petitioner's made her point. I have to say I don't necessarily agree with it. I do tend to agree with the position that, frankly, adultery has passed its time and divorce should be on the basis of irretrievable breakdown. But it does seem to me that we're clearly at a position where the government has no plans. We've had the programme for government. We're in spring 2015. Uh, so the government is not going to be legislating on this or anything between now and you know, the end of a parliamentary term in 2016. It would be for an incoming administration, whoever that may be, to decide their priorities. Ultimately, I think a lot of this is more for the Scottish Law Commission, and I certainly know informally that they don't have any plans given the recent discussions. So it seems to me that we have had recent discussions. The government have no plans. There is nothing on the legislative uh, timetable. The timescales are against us, and really it will be for future administrations after 2016 to consider, or indeed the Law Commission, if at some stage we decide to do a review uh, through them, perhaps on the, uh, uh, on the law of, of divorce or more likely wider family law. Members agree the action point raised by Mr McCaskill? I'm happy to agree. You know. uh, we not, uh, whilst I agree with what Jenny McCaskill is saying, I think the petitioner needs to know that they have the right to come back after a year as well. So uh, if, uh, although we, we may close it today, it doesn't stop you from bringing it back. OK, then. Agreed action point, then. Oh, right. Can I thank you, Ms. Jones, for attending? Thank you. Now suspend for a couple of minutes.
No, you know. Okay. Uh, the, the third petition today is PE1552 by Peter Campbell on the choice of treatment for cancer patients. Members have a note by the clerk and a space briefing and the petition. And may I welcome Peter Campbell and Peter Adams uh, to the meeting. I invite Mr. Campbell to speak to his petition for around five minutes, after which we will move to questions. Now, I understand that both of you want to share in the presentation. So, over to you, Mr. Campbell. Well, I'd like, first, minutes. I'd like to say uh, I'm a deaf person, a uh, war pensioner, a uh, member of the 51st Highland Division, and uh, I sustained an injury while in uh, Argyles. Uh, and uh, I'd like you to speak up, shout at me so I can hear. I'll be grateful for that. I'm always getting shouted at. Uh, Sergeant Major says that, I know. But anyway, I'm Pierre Campbell, and I've come forward here uh, watching uh, my family die in front of me, which should no parent should ever witness what I witnessed, especially through my daughter, Barbara. And I, I'll read a short statement here. And Barbara worked in a hospice for eight years, so she knew all about cancer. I'll never forget that day. And she came in with my other daughter-in-law and sat down, you know, there's something coming. And I said, what's wrong with you, Barbara? And she said, Dad, look, I've got a wee lump in my breast. I said, well, you, you, you're you a nurse, Barbara, and you, you'll you deal with that. I said, you want a hospice, and you, you know what cancer's all about, darling, don't you? But anyway, she took off, and that was 2006. And I was to witness by 2010, my daughter actually been butchered. That's the only words I'm going to use, right? And uh, she had one breast taken off, and then the next breast come off. And uh, the time it came, at 2010, uh, uh, I just, I just stomached it, and I just said, "God, I'm a war pens. I've not seen so much cruelty in all my life to my daughter, and, and, and legal times here. And it's when I saw health services doing it, I just couldn't take it all in. I just knew it wasn't right. And time went on, and uh, Barbara succumbed to death, and." Uh, uh, that's my statement, and uh, it's just uh, it's, when I think about it now, I just feel like uh, I'm so so angry. Knowing uh, it was legal murder, mass murder, in my eyes anyway, it was legal mass murder. What was happening? But because Barbara and I, uh, we surfed the net, and we found all sorts of uh, communication people uh, uh, who are helping to cure uh, cancer through other means, uh, for example, electric medicine, which I brought uh, an example with me today, uh, £4,000 it cost, uh, a machine they call it a photogeny, which I am on every day, and my wife got Alzheimer's, and she's on every night, and she's responding to uh, dementia on this uh, electric medicine. And uh, this and other good things is all coming to me. As I say again, I've got to refer to myself. I'm a reborn Christian. I was cured by cancer in Medjugorje in 2004. Uh, uh, 94, I was cured by cancer. Okay? Right, thank you for your part of the presentation. Can we now move over to Mr Adams, thank please? Thank you for allowing me to speak in support of Peter's petition. Since the introduction of the, 19, the Cancer Act in 1939, we believe that cancer sufferers have been failed by the British medical system, which only offers the three-pronged treatments of chemotherapy, radiation and surgery. I believe it was Albert Einstein who said the definition, definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I suggest that this madness is evidence in our cancer treatments. In fact, a recent report which just came out said that breast cancer patients who rejected all conventional treatments are four times longer survival rates than those who follow the system. Cancer statistics show that in the UK, especially Scotland, we have among the lowest survival rates within the EU. One of the countries far above us is Germany, where the system allows cancer patients to use other forms of treatment if the first round of conventional treatment doesn't work. Here, if the parent asks about or does suggest other treatments, I know that some of them are actually belittled in some cases and not threatened with ostracisation and not getting any further treatment. If we look outside Europe, there is a beacon of light in Dr Contreras' Oasis of Hope in Mexico. The success rate there is on average double the survival rate at the five-year point of our cancer units. Yet the majority of those attending the clinic were presenting at stage four cancer, having already gone through conventional treatment and having been said we can do nothing further for you. The question is, how come his patients have a much better survival rate than ours do here in Scotland? 
would it not be a good idea to have a look and find out why? There are a large number of treatments used in various parts of the world which are successfully treating patients, such as the protocol which Peter has mentioned. There is intravenous vitamin C, laetrile, ESIAC, ozone therapy, immunotherapy, and name a few. Because these are using products which cannot be patented, there's no incentive for the pharmaceutical industry to produce them or for anyone to actually spend money testing them against the so-called gold standard. Therefore, they will never be accepted or even trialled because of the restrictions of our health system in the 1939 Cancer Act. With our devolved health system here in Scotland, we have the opportunity to look outside the conventional can cancer treatment box and encourage treatment already in use in other parts of the world for the benefits of our citizens. Yeah, yeah. This would not only result in better outcomes for the patient, but lessen the cost to the health budget. And we all know how we are struggling with ever increasing numbers and costs. There's a whole world of information out there. Please be open-minded. Find out more about what is working across the world instead of paying for the ever increasing and exorbitantly expensive magic bullets promised by some research labs and pharmaceutical companies. If we do not take steps to incorporate successful treatments already available to others, we will continue having to fund the ever-increasing cost of cancer treatments, which we all know this country cannot afford. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from members? With regards, Mr Adams, to the information you just provided the committee with, did you at any given time, did you perhaps pass that information on to the Scottish Government or to the Scottish Task Force for, for, for I have attention? At I have at previous times passed this information on. The first time was to Nicola Sturgeon when she was the Health Minister at a conference up in Stirling. Uh, and also there have been a couple of other inf uh, times there where I've again passed on similar information. And, and also... I was, for a number of years, part of the pilot project uh, with the health board across in Fife. I was one of the elected uh, health board members. Uh, and again, I have raised that a couple of times within the, their system. Uh, and in fact, at one of the times on our uh, board information system, we had uh, the cancer people in there, and we were allowed to sort of question and answer them. And again... Um, when I did ask questions, I was given the same treatment as I mentioned in there. They looked down their noses and attempt to belittle you because this isn't within the standardised <coughs> treatment. I would like to come in here and say... I, I approached Nicholas Sturgeon when my daughter was alive, telling Nicholas Sturgeon my daughter had been uh, more or less uh, uh, going through a terrible time. And uh, no one, uh, I never got a Nicholas Sturgeon uh, in here, uh, but I got to the secretary and I gave them all the information. That was away, uh, two years after uh, my daughter was diagnosed. Uh, I was shouting wolf to everybody in Scotland, wolf to everybody in Scotland about what's happening. Uh, but then one year out there. Okay. Kenny? What position the cancer charities take on this, such as Cancer Research UK, Macmillan, Breast Cancer Research? Well, there is a Cancer that I, a charity that I'm involved in is Cancer Active. Um, they are now one of the best holistic um, cancer charities out there. Uh, and I've brought a copy of their icon, their Integrated Cancer and Oncology News Along, uh, which I'd like to leave a copy for the, the records here so people can have a look through it. Um, in my opinion, Cancer Research UK is part of the problem because they are too tied in with the pharmaceutical companies uh, and they are actually, in a lot of ways, subsidising the shareholders by doing a, putting a lot of money in there for research which the pharmaceutical companies should be doing. They think they can walk water. The, the pharmaceutical companies think they can walk in water, but it's time they were confronted. That's what it's all about. It's all about money. Yeah, but, but we're here to talk about alternative treatments, Mr yeah. Campbell. Uh, we're not here to uh, put the sparge on some of these other companies, so you just probably... Keep to your line. As I say, the, the Any other uh, questions from the members? Angus? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, you, you've made reference to uh, what you say is, is working abroad. Um, what research have you actually done? Do you, is there any research that you can there point is, us towards? I haven't got the actual bit there, but there, there is lots of research. A, everything that's in here in the ICON news, there is a section on there what is current both conventional and non-conventional uh, 
around the world, and that's got references to the various reserves. There is other, again, um, as I'm not one of these people who keeps things in my head about you know, which research, but I, there is a lot of evidence out there, uh, and I'm quite happy to sort of pass that on, uh, forward it to the, the committee so that they can dig further. Uh, but the, the one I mentioned there on Dr. Contreras, his clinic has been running for 50 years. It was started by his father. Um, and as I say, the success rate or the success rate there is twice what we've got here. So they must be something doing, doing something right that we're not doing here. Just go and have a look at it. Where is that? That's across in Mexico, that particular one. I'd like to come in and but say my wife's got Alzheimer's now and I'm flying her out to Mayo Clinic in Florida to get Mr. her cured. Campbell, Mr Campbell, okay, let people answer the questions please, yeah. It would be helpful if we could get some of that information just to look at the yeah. convener. Okay. okay. Any further questions? As there are no further questions, can I ask the committee what action it would like to take on this petition? Could I perhaps suggest then that we write to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Cancer Task Force and the Cancer Research UK to ask about the extent to which choice of treatment exists for cancer patients and for views of what the petition seeks? as well um, to seek to seek their views okay then. and obviously taking on board what uh, mr. Adams has alleged with regard to cancer research UK um, uh, given that they're one of the uh, charities that we, we we intend to write to is it possible to uh, wait till we get the information from Mr. Adams in regards to evidence from um, around the world that he suggests that's available and that might be helpful? Yeah, I think it will be helpful, but I think in the meantime, I think probably we should we, we should agree with the action that we agreed there, more right to, more right to these people, yeah. and, then we, and then we can, uh, when hopefully both of them will come in together, and then we can make a decision on the petition. For option two, Mr. Chairman, instead of option one. Yeah, well, we, we've agreed to go yeah, for yeah, option one. And, uh, so can I thank Mr Adams and, and Mr Campbell for attendance and uh, I now close the meeting. Thank you. Yeah.